him for the ministry of the word. Our first lesson is from Deuteronomy chapter 23. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, be prompt in doing whatever you promised him. For the Lord your God demands that you will promptly fulfill all your vows. If you don't, you will be guilty of sin. However, it is not a sin to refrain from making a vow. But once you have made, voluntarily made a vow, be careful to do as you have said. For you have made a vow to the Lord your God. Our second lesson from Hebrews chapter 6. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. When people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. Without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath, so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given us both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can take new courage, for we can hold on to his promise with confidence. The third lesson is from Matthew chapter 14. When Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work within him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful, lawful for you to, say, to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people, because they considered John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests, and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist." The king was distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted. He had John beheaded in prison. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Scott said, the heat's turned on. I blame my wife for that. <laughs> I couldn't bring her over two weeks ago. It's just so cold in here. She turned the thing on. Yeah. I think our Americans have it. Temperature covers under about five degrees either way. This means we got to have heat. This means we got to have cooling. So forgive me for preaching in my shirt sleeves. We are preaching a series of sermons from the Sermon on the Mount, the third part of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is demonstrating his authority. You have heard it said, Jesus says again and again, and then he always says, but I say it. And God's Word has much to say about speech, which Dr. Webster defines as active verbal communication. And material for excellent sermons is contained in any one of these passages. James 1 9, where James says, Be quick to listen, but slow to speak. In Ephesians 4, when Paul talks about the importance of our speaking the truth in love. Colossians 4, when Paul says, Let your speech always be seasoned with grace. Matthew 12, when our Lord says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of your mouth is coming from your heart. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 9 says, he who restrains his lips is wise. In Exodus 20, 16, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And in James 3, which we just read with the kids, James reminds us that the tongue 
is a fire and can do great damage. All of us, I think I've preached from over the years, and all of them contain good sermons. But this morning's sermon text is about a speech accessory, the oath. Now, in this day and age, not many people swear by this or that. Except maybe in court. Anybody ever put your hands in the Bible and sworn? No one? They still do that? But I mean, do they make you put your hand in the Bible? They just make you, they just make you what? Promise? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one time, you, you, you know, the, the, the clerk held out a Bible. A Bible. An American courts. And you put your left hand in the Bible and raise your right hand and said, I solemnly swear. Now, what are you doing when you swear when you have the Bible? What are you swearing? What are you swearing by a higher power? I guess that's it. I've never broken it down. But I guess you're swearing on a higher power, which is behind the Word of God, which, at least popularly speaking, uh, our country still recognizes as the Word of God. But uh, we don't, besides things like that, we don't do oaths. We, we, most of us have taken a vow. We're valid. What's the last time you took a vow? Or made a vow? It's your wedding, probably. You exchange vows. And you, you seal those vows with a little token, your wedding ring. Uh, most of us deal in, in the uh, assurity, the speech accessory, which is not as awesome as an oath, and, and not quite as formal as a vow. It is the, the weak, uh, frivolous, semi-binding tool we call promise. We always promise things. Well, I'll be there, I promise. Oh, I'll bring that, I promise. I won't forget, I, I promise not to forget. And on and on we go. Oaths, vows, and promises share a common function. They are verbal tools used to convince others, even to convince ourselves, even to convince God. That we really mean, really, really mean what we have said, what we have promised to do. By the time of Christ, the purpose of oaths and vows had been so twisted and tricked up that he felt it necessary to present to his new disciples a fresh and more author authoritative teaching on the whole matter of telling In keeping with the spirit of Luke and Katie's class, let's begin today's lesson with a bit of self-confrontation. Are you, to be honest now, a truthful person? Can you, as a confessing Christian, be trusted, always trusted, to say what you really need and to always need on that and pray. Thank you, Lord, for this text and for this teaching of our Lord. As always, Father, it is our prayer that you confront us with things that we need to change or to remove or to add to our lives for your glory and our blessing and for the blessing of others. Help us, Father, to be honest with ourselves. Give us ears to hear, anoint our ears and our hearts to respond to your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 33. Matthew 5, 33. So far in his sermon, Jesus has said, uh, you have heard this about murder, but I tell you. Uh, you've heard this about adultery, but I tell you. 
Uh, you've heard this about divorce, but I tell you. And now verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath. But fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. That's what you've heard over the years. But I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is God's footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil. For the first time in this series, Jesus is not quoting directly from the Ten Commandments when he says, you've heard it said. And that should remind us that Jesus had no issue with the Ten Commandments. He had no issue with the Law of Moses. But he did take issue with centuries of scribes and rabbis and Pharisees who had so tampered with the Law of Moses and added layers and more layers of creative religious thinking to parse out what the Ten Commandments says so simply in order to make it easy to break a law without really breaking it. You know what I mean? Who can read Exodus chapter 20, verse 7? That is the third commandment which is what Jesus is talking about here. Anyone? Just a few words. Exodus 27. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, when I was a kid, it was made very clear to me that means no cussing. There's two kinds of cursing, you know, there's profanity and there's vulgarity. Profanity is when you use the name of God. Vulgarity is when you disarm vulgar without any religious foundation at all. The Ten Commandments include only ten laws handed down to God's people. One of which says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Is it only about cursing? about epithets. It's about swearing. It's about saying, by God, I mean it. By God, if you touch that, I'll have you in jail. That's taking God's name in vain. In what way? Or by saying something may have been vulgar for me, a profane for a minute. God, it's hot today. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. What does it mean to say you take the Lord's name, the Lord's the God's name in vain? It's like saying God is a person. For certain, you are you are invoking, you are you are asking, you are commanding God to act in some cases. Gee. Mm -hmm. But how else? And this is important for our world. This is one of the ways that Christians can shine light. That verse means, that commandment simply means, whenever you use God's name, you must use it with reverence. And this is a world that knows little about reverence. About common decency, about respect. And God says, respect begins right here. If you, you know, the Israelites would not even say God's name. They wouldn't say it. It was so holy, it was so sacred, they were afraid that they might be struck dead and it came out of their mouths. The word Yahweh, you know, is not really a word, it's a made up word, so they wouldn't say God's name. We throw it around, Christians and non-Christians. I go to my grandkids' house in Connecticut, I love my children and our grandkids, but they use God's name all the time. God, I hate that. It makes my skin crawl. 
I don't think parents stop them. I don't think they get this commitment. God said, don't take my name in vain. I'm the Lord your God. How dare you speak my name with anything but absolute knee-buckling reverence. We've gotten way past that. And so when Jesus invokes this, he wants to, his disciples to learn something fresh and new because that had been so changed by the scribes and Pharisees over the years. The Mishnah, you heard me mention that, that's many, many volumes, thick volumes of takes on the wall that the Pharisees and scribes compiled over the years. This is what God said. This is what God really means. And page after page after page of man-made tradition and creative religious thinking, which is fluent today in all modern contemporary uh, uh, liberal churches. And so by the time of Jesus, vows have been and oaths have been divided into two groups. Those that were binding and those that weren't. Why make a non-binding vow, I ask you? If you were so bold as to invoke God's name, the Pharisee said, you must keep that promise. But, if you want to make your promise or your vow or your oath semi-binding, then swear by heaven. Or, or swear by the earth. Or... or the Godfather said, I swear on the heads of my children. What a horrible thing that is to say. And Luke made a passage in Hebrews where the writer of that epistle reminds us of Genesis 15 when God took an oath on himself. He made this spectacular promise to Abraham of a progeny that would last forever in number like the stars in the heavens to a 99 year old childless father, childless man and so God swore an oath with that demonstration of walking the, the torch in the oven between those cut in half things God was saying, I swear by my oneness reminded that when people do take an oath, they swear on a force greater than themselves to enforce it. So when you say, I swear by heaven, what does that mean? Jesus said it's nonsense. I say to you, Jesus said, and this is the new covenant, I say to you, don't swear at all. So now, what did the old covenant actually say about swearing? Let's, let's look for a minute. Genesis 24, I'll come back to that one, that's my favorite. Numbers 30, Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel, saying, this is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. Le Leviticus 19, you shall not swear by my name falsely, says the Lord, and so profane my name, I am the Lord, Deuteronomy 10, 20, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. So swearing was common in the Old Testament under the law, and most likely Deuteronomy, God commands us. If we're going to swear an oath, just make sure you swear by my name, because I am the only power that can guarantee whatever you swear. And be sure you keep that power. Where wedding vows come from. I'm intrigued by Genesis 24. It's the first swearing in the Bible. It is the great story of Abraham sending out uh, his servant to, uh, to uh, find a, a wife for Isaac. God's promise was kept. Abraham had a son. Sarah bore a son in her old age. And Abraham knew that God had promised that uh, a, a great nation would come out of his loins, so he's going to make sure Isaac marries well, marries into the family as it were, and sends this servant on a mission to leave Canaan. nothing but trash around here. I don't want to bring any of these girls. I want you to go back to my home and get a, a girl from our tribe 
and let Isaac marry her, and I want you to swear to me you'll do this. And I want you to swear this way. Put your hand under my thigh. I was always intrigued by that. And you know, of course, you know what that means. Maybe you don't know what it means. It is a polite way of saying, grab me by my manhood. Reach under my robe here. Hold. I promise. You're swearing on my seed, Abraham said. You're swearing on God's promise, on God's covenant. So swearing in the Old Testament can be summed up how? What? Vulgar. Vulgar. <laughs> Only that one thing. What, how, how would you summarize the Old Testament's teaching on swearing? Serious. Take it seriously. Only swear by the name of God, which makes it serious. Don't swear, but swearing is okay. And it's also okay not to swear. And so people have, ever since then, forever, been adding this accessory to their promise or their statement uh, to let, let the listener know that we really mean what we say. But Jesus said, no, no, no. That was then, this is now. A new covenant, which will be sealed in my blood. Do not swear at all. Now, if you're a businessman, bless your heart, if you're a lawyer, mm -hmm. And you hear Jesus say these words, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. How many times have we said yes or no without really meaning it? Oh, if you're in business way too many times. Yeah, I'll be there this week. The check's in the mail. Uh, I'll be there Tuesday, I promise. Uh, sure, he's not here right now, but he's right next door. We want to talk to you guys. So we tell these little lies all the time. We've gotten so used to it that someone well, years ago decided to call them white lies. There's no such thing. We don't tell the truth when it suits our purpose, when it is completely about self-preservation. And we've gotten okay with that. And Jesus, I, I tell you, don't swear, let your yes, don't even promise, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. Anything else, he goes on to say, if you don't do just that, you are working in the realm of Satan. We don't think of white lies like that. Once again, Jesus is showing you his disciples then and now. That we can shine like beacons in this dark world by obeying our Lord in the simplest ways, by gaining a reputation as someone, oh yeah, oh yeah, she always tells the truth. How many saw the movie Liar Liar? Remember that movie? <laughs> it was very funny. For that reason. Of course, Jim Carrey plays a lawyer. We love to make lawyer jokes. And he's forced by some mysterious power to always tell the truth, even when everyone knows you probably shouldn't tell the truth right then. <laughs> and he does. And we are, we laugh at it, but here's the point. We are so used to covering ourselves, to avoiding complications, to protecting ourselves by little white lies. No, he's not here. He won't be in town for a week. Uh, no, I just, it, yes, whatever. And Jesus says, here's a chance to shine in the world. Well, that, well you know, if you, if you want someone to tell this person what has to be said, let her do it. She always tells the absolute truth. And that is a sterling reputation to have. And of course, if you have that reputation, your boss might, might not always use you to communicate. I think I might have told you before when I, got, I started a new job when I was a young man, and I got a chance to tell my boss, who didn't know me from Adam except our, our, our interview, that uh, I, I'm a Christian. Uh, I won't lie to you, and I won't lie for you. Mm. I got a chance to actually say that. Mm. And he took it seriously. So there were times when he wanted someone to be lied to, and he didn't let me do it. Because I wouldn't. Not because I'm so good. I just had this golden moment of a brand new start in a brand new company. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there are times, church, I've got to share this, when you don't have to tell the whole truth. Mm -hmm. What would that be? That's not this evil dude, but I don't mean that. When it would hurt someone else, and you do it to get it off your back. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. Husbands and wives, listen carefully. There are certain things that your spouse does not have to know. You might be sorry for this, and it's eating at you. If you want to share with your spouse, pray about it carefully. Because is it true? Is it necessary? Is it edifying? Those are the questions. Is it true? Is what you're about to say true? Is what you're about to say necessary? Is what you're about to say edifying? Mm -hmm. Does it build someone up? Mm -hmm. Or will it crush someone? Mm -hmm. Is this completely selfish? I've got to get this off my chest. Or is this meant to be to start a healing or to do something good? Those are good questions. But let's back up from that and just talk about your present life. If you can leave this church today with a promise to God that, Lord, I, I'm going to take Jesus at his word. I'm going to, from this day forward, talking to my spouse, talking to my children, talking to my neighbor, talking to my boss, talking to my employees, I'm going to let my yes be yes and my no be no, and I'm going to gain a reputation of that kind of person. Oh, that's, yeah, there is speaking. It's almost impossible in business to do that. Yeah, well, long, long ago, uh, when I was promoted to a point where I had people beneath me, I, I wrote a policy letter about doing things that are very important when it comes to land, being a land surveyor, and, and how we uh, uh, conduct ourselves and how what we do with numbers, which are black and white, but what we do with them isn't always black and white. So I wrote about 20 sentences, and, and the letter, which never went anywhere at first, went before the branch manager. I have used the word subordinates. Oh my goodness. No. By the time he got done with that letter, there was only three sentences left, and it meant nothing. Hard to do in business. No, it's hard. Not impossible. Jesus, I, I got a look for a verse where Jesus says, let your yes be yes, you know, you know, unless you're in business. You don't say that. You did the right thing. Your editor, your boss, edited it. That's his business. See, it is hard. It is hard because we've conditioned ourselves to believe it is not good, it is okay not to go with it. Jesus says, no. If you're my disciple, you'll be different. And you will swear, the old saying goes, to your own hurt. Yeah, it's, it is tricky. Difficult. And in some places, it's impossible, which will, may cost you your job. I'm not saying this lightly, folks. I'm saying how radical a thing it is to be a disciple of Christ. He's talking here to brand new disciples, the ones he's just called. You guys know what you're in for? You've heard this said. I'm telling you this. You've heard this. I'm telling you this. Let your yes from now on. Don't swear by anything. When you mean yes, say yes. When you mean no, say no, let it drop. And after all, people know when he says no, he means it. When he says yes, he means it. Yeah. Once again, you'll shine. You'll shine in the world with the light. So if Jesus is not commanding us to never swear, to never make a vow, to never take an oath, then what is he saying? What does he mean? What are his 21st century disciples to learn from this teaching? As Eric is pointing out to us, he is telling his disciples, and that includes us, simply to tell the truth at all times and all circumstances, to say yes and mean it, to say no and mean it, no shading, no slanting, no half-truths, you know what I mean. No embellishing a story to make you look better or more clever or more brave. No conditional, frivolous, or insincere promises. The disciple's speech must be, here's a word, Christians, no, recoil from sometimes, our speech must be disciplined. Disciplined in the truest sense, brought under the control of Christ's Lordship by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us, each one this morning, purpose to refrain and refine our speech until all that we say is sincere and spoken in love. All that we say of God is reverent. And all that we tell is true 
and truly necessary. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it edifying? To the glory of God, solely to His glory. It's a small lesson, Father, but it's an important one. We live in a world of lies and half truths. They show up on posters, on TV screens, in pamphlets, sometimes in our own handwriting. And Father, this, this call of our Lord to be absolutely truthful at all times is tricky in our world. So Father, we need grace. We need grace to obey our Lord. Show us, Father, how to be brave enough to tell the truth. How to say what we mean and mean what we say at all times. To your glory, Father, not for our sake. We, we usually lie to protect ourselves, Father. This produces speech as something that we do for your glory. So, Lord, show us how to do it. Forgive us for the times we'll fail. Help us, Lord, not to be hurtful of our words. Father, let our children and grandchildren see what speech seasoned with grace looks like, sounds like, what the absolute truth always feels like. And we ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name, and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name.